So I'm going to be moderating the session. My name is uh, Colin Soskolny. I'm uh, just about to retire from the University of Alberta in Edmonton, and um, my transitioning into the next phase of my career is going to be more in collaboration with colleagues at the University of Canberra in Australia, where I've just spent uh, about five months, and uh, I hope to see more collaboration with them into the future. Just to mention that my talk is called Narrowing the Gap Through Attention to Values and Ethics in Public Health Risk Assessment. The second person on the panel, who you see at the table over here, is uh, Dr. Vanilia Randall. She's a Doctor of Laws, Doctor of Jurisprudence, and she'll be speaking Dying While Black, Why Colorblind Policies Won't Eliminate the Slave Health Deficit. And the third speaker in the series will be Dr. William Winslade, and he's also a doctor of jurisprudence, and he'll be speaking about human needs, human rights, and access to health care for everyone. So what you will find is that there is a diversity of presentation, even in the session on ethics, both from the public health ethics perspective, which I'll be delivering, and then the other two from a more legal dimension. I'll, my talk is probably going to last about an hour, and I'm trying to be cognizant of the fact that we have an audience in Florida, and we should also allow them time to ask questions as well as you can follow. I've got a number of slides, and many of them are just prompts more to me to make certain points, so they will go quite quickly, and I won't be spending too much time on any one of them. I do want to just point out to you that you'll see my URL under my name, www.colinsoskolny, one word, first name, last name, dot com, and this particular talk is already uploaded to the archive section under PowerPoint slides on that website, so if you want to look at them there, you will be able to do it for a long time to come into the future as well. Um, and I've already mentioned uh, my connections with the University of Alberta and the University of Canberra in Australia. Okay, I want to start off by talking about the need to narrow the gap. And I'll tie this in as my talk goes on with gaps as were recognized at the founding, by the founding fathers of this country and the founding uh, families, if you will, of the French government and of the Canadian government. So I'll tie all of this notion of disparities into our foundational core values that we all, I believe, have hardwired into our brains in terms of how we function and what we expect, not just from ourselves, but from our various governments. Now, what gap am I talking about? As I said, this talk now is very much a follow-up from what we've heard this morning. Um, we heard earlier about the Millennium Development Goals, which was set up in the year 2000 with the deadline of 2015, which is just two years away. To, and the, you see on the slide the eight uh, goals that were identified in order to try to reduce the gap that was ever widening. Um, you'll see the eradication of extreme poverty and hunger, universal primary education, gender equality, reducing childhood mortality, improving maternal health, combating HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases ensuring environmental sustainability and developing a global partnership for development. I would like to make just one point, and I was discussing this just a little earlier with uh, Dr. Fortune, and we uh, heard that in fact PAHO is coming out with a document that is going to look even more upstream than what the social determinants of health do, as presented by Sir Richard Mahmoud, and that is uh, Sir Michael Mahmoud, and that is to look at what really determines the health of everything that we depend on for life on Earth, which is number seven. If we don't have an environment, we have no economy. If we don't have an environment, we certainly don't have health. So that is the most important upstream determinant. And for people from Texas who have been in extreme denial over the contributions of the energy sector to global warming, uh, this is, we, we have exceeded now 400 parts per million in the upper atmosphere of carbon dioxide, and the future is indeed becoming more dangerous in terms of extreme weather phenomena, and I think the United States is recognizing this after Katrina in 2005, I think it was in this morning's newspaper here um, in, in Houston, that uh, the amount spent through insurance is just second to that year in 2012. 
So um, the next, the final one is to develop a global partnership for development. Now, the thing that we have to recognize in setting these kinds of goals at the supranational or the international level is to look at why this would be necessary. And I think anyone with uh, even a slight amount of intuition would recognize that we are on a non-sustainable path if we currently try to operate with what's called a 10-90 split or gap, where in fact, to bring it home to the health sector, 90% of the research funding goes to diseases that affect just 10% of the population. Earlier this morning, we heard about the 99%, 1%. So these are just ballpark numbers to show you the extreme nature of this unfairness or inequity that exists in the world. Now, the Millennium Development Goals were set, as I said, in 2000, amid a flurry of idealism and hope. But in fact, even though we may have heard this morning that there have been some advances in some areas, in general, the movement towards reducing these gaps is pitiful and hardly uh, measurable in many, many areas. So they are now, as you heard, you have a wonderful opportunity right now in 2013 to work towards how those goals might be revised and what the outcomes might be in terms of measuring success or failure. The trick in all of what we do is to think globally about the consequences of our actions, whether we're in Texas or we from Canada, um, to think globally, but to act locally. Now, what do I mean by this? We have several lenses through which we can apply our skills, and I couldn't agree more with um, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee when she responded to the question, how do you, what do we do? How do we find a path that mean, is meaningful to ourselves? And her advice was to follow your passion. Do what you feel passionate about. Realize that there are wonderful opportunities out there to make a change in the world. And the world really needs to have a serious impact on the existing paradigms that we live by. Whether we're looking at your uh, president or prime minister of Canada, to some of us, certainly in the health sector, these people are not necessarily on the track that we think we need to be for a healthful society and a sustainable future. Now, when we look at the issue of um, thinking globally, we could look at the world and its problems, what I call a macro level lens. If you imagine that you're flying at 40,000 feet, you're looking at global problems from a state, country, or global level. Now, your passion may be, and your talents and your attributes may be that you do better working at that level than, say, at the other extreme, at the micro level lens where you're on the ground, like nurses or physicians working one on one level, like the physician patient relationship. You may be able to work at all three of these levels, the middle one being the meso level where you operate from a health point of view at the regional city or community level. So find your passion, know which one of these levels you feel you can best operate at, and when you don't set the bar too high for yourself, you're likely to find that your passion is fulfilled, that you can actually achieve your goals for yourself. Let me start off at the micro level, locally, with some wonderful work that comes out of the United States on this very topic. First, I want to tie it in to uh, work out of the United Kingdom again, which is what Michael Marmot had done, um, and look at a book that was published by Richard Wilkinson. It was actually a second edition of, uh, of his own authored book from nine, about 1996, but it came out in 2010, and it's called The Spirit Level, Why Great Equality Makes Society Stronger. I didn't hear this book particularly referenced this morning at all, in fact, but all of these links on this website are all live links, they're hot links, so you can find these introductions as you, you do go to this website. Obviously, I don't have time to go through each of them. But why do we need equality? Well, it's based on evidence, and I stress to you, and it was a point that I didn't think came out this morning, we speak very much as scientists of the need to develop evidence, but think of your George W. Bush administration. Sorry, he did come from Texas, I understand. <laughs> but think of what that man single-handedly did to marginalize the scientific discourse, the evidence. The basic argument is, don't confuse me with the facts. I have my ideological basis, and it's the ideology that's going to drive policy. At the end of the day, it's the policy that determines health. 
So we have to be attuned to that. And you know where the goalposts are as young people today, as people like myself and the other panelists this morning expose this kind of thing for you. This is the reality that we're faced with, and it's a very exciting uh, opportunities to be hopeful about the future, as long as you follow Congresswoman Lee's suggestion to get involved, get engaged. Don't just sit and worry about passing your exams at the end of the year, or recycling your garbage, or um, taking the bus every day. Do all of those things, certainly, to ensure a sustainable future, but leave a little bit of time at the end of the day, to not take the burden of responsibility on your individual shoulders, but work collectively, write letters to the editor, get engaged with the public discourse on these matters, get involved in the elections, make sure good people stand to office and have the integrity to deliver on what they promise to deliver on, recognizing the frailties and the delicacies of the political process. But why equality here? If we look at the evidence, <coughs> This book will show you how, comparing England with the United States and some other countries, how the physical health of people declines. We've heard all of it this morning, so I don't need to review it. But it talks about the state of mental health, of drug abuse, of education, imprisonment, obesity, social mobility, incarceration rates. So it, it's, it just doesn't end. Childhood, well-being, rich and poor countries, equality and global warming. All of these disparities have implications for a worsening situation. There's a TED lecture on this topic, for many of you, who I'm sure most of you are familiar with, the TED lecture series, it takes 17 minutes. There's a wonderful transcript that's included with it if you want to read it more carefully, produced a year ago, and um, that was uh, through, uh, that, that is available at that hot link as well, on this book, The Spur of Level. The leveling of society, you know what we use, spur of level, scoring construction, right? If you're hanging pictures, you want to make sure you get the level, you put a spur of level on top. Let's move from the micro level to the meso level. Out of um, Lawrence Goston's work at the O'Neill Institute, um, is that George Washington University, as well as connected with Johns Hopkins, I believe, um, why the Affordable Health Care Act's individual purchase mandate is both constitutional and indispensable to the public welfare. A nice critique and um, support, really, for what hope we might expect from that legislation. At the macro level, also out of uh, the, uh, this group under Larry Boston in uh, Baltimore and Virginia, he's got an article called, uh, well, describing that institute's major global health initiative called the Joint Action and Learning Initiative on National and Global Responsibilities for Health. And what he's really trying to promote, many of you may be aware of the Framework Convention on Tobacco. That took, a, and so it was actually a Canadian working at the WHO, something like 17 years to get that effected and implemented. Or what Larry Gostin's working on is something equivalent as a Framework Convention on Global Health. And, um, this article describes the virtues of doing that. It seeks to ensure that the principles of a uh, framework convention on global health, including universal health coverage and the importance of people being able to claim and enforce the right to health, are central to the post-millennium development world agenda. This man is a giant in the world out of uh, Johns Hopkins and George Washington. <coughs> Surveys that have been done in the United States, contrary to what Republicans and Democrats might argue about in Congress and the perception that they leave uh, the American public with, want a fairer society. We heard a lot about fairness this morning. And uh, you know, and if you read, if you can see the beginning of this, it says, forget the socialist bashing rhetoric and the reverence of the filthy rich when it comes to wealth distribution. Americans, even Republicans, would really rather live somewhere like Sweden believe it or not. So why is it that we heard this morning even Texans vote against their best interests? What is it? What is the fear factor? Is it the spin doctors, that uh, the public relations firm that instill fear that we're going to lose jobs because of transition? Well, these are the things that young people hopefully will embrace and tackle. The ethical dimensions of climate change, thanks to Johnson and Pat's out of Wisconsin, um, this is a, a cartogram that shows the proportional size of different countries. In the top part of the graph, you can see Africa is very small in the bottom center. South America is very small. Canada and the United States are the big fat cats on the left-hand side there. 
on the top graph, but when, and that represents our contributions to global warming in terms of contributions of tons of carbon. In the lower part of the graph, who's suffering the consequences of the way we choose to live our lives in North America? A mortality per million population is what's shown at the bottom. It's the people, if you compare, let's just take Africa. In the top graph, you see that Africa is the largest single continent uh, at the bottom there, very inflated, but very diminished in the upper graph, contributing very little to the problem, but suffering the consequences more than what we in the rich countries have available to us to buffer ourselves against extreme weather phenomena, for example, or to recover from it. Of course, tornadoes and hurricanes are a different story. Now, I pick on the president of this country, the Prime Minister of Canada, and supranational governance and how this electoral process works, but I also appeal to us as professionals to embrace the virtue called humility. <coughs> We need to have a little bit of humility. If we're not willing to get engaged and get people elected and take back control of our lives from the corporations that have taken the right to be treated as people in this country for the past hundred years and therefore influence everything from funding arrangements, whether we're talking about WHO, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the United Nations, and universities in this country and in Canada, we need to have a bit of humility then for the people in policy. Why? because science, unless you were part of the Bush administration, had is foundational to how we make decisions on the basis of evidence. But if your ideology drives you and you poo-poo science and you marginalize it, well then science doesn't really matter. But in a rational world, you believe that if you generally invest millions in science, you would like to at least give it its fair place around the table, not push it away from policy-making tables, as happened so much certainly in the latter part of the Bush administration. But let's, why, why we need to have a bit of humility for the Bushes and the Harpers and the people that we elect into government, they are, have, they're not necessarily trained nurses or physicians or scientists or epidemiologists. They have to understand these broader issues and generally they are relatively very competent and very bright and well-meaning people. But when you don't really have the knowledge, we have enough trouble in science understanding the use of science to informing policy, how are they meant to understand how it's used, especially when there are enormously powerful interests that are putting pressure on them in addition to the science or besides the science, whether they're religious interests or cultural interests or stakeholder interests, media interests, minority interests, they have to respond to all of those interests. So I move to this next slide point out that science is just one such pressure in advocacy on policymakers. But let's be a bit humble, but also keep their feet to the fire, get engaged, and call them on it when they are not honoring what they promised to do. You can't just leave it to them. I think it was the Rolling Stone after uh, Mr. Obama was elected pointed out that the American public now really needed to get involved. But of course, we are all too busy and we're distracted by the need to make a living and all these economic upheavals and uh, leave it to the politicians in good faith to assume they'll do what they said they would do. Um, now, there are many influences that come to bear in our scientific endeavors. These influences are the same influences that would influence the WHO, that would influence our universities, that influence everything, and they usually are powerful money dealers. I'm working on a case right now been doing it since about 2005, in fact, on asbestos and Canada's unconscionable role in lying and deceiving the developing world that asbestos can be safely used. It obstructed the, uh, the listing of chrysotile as a, chrysotile asbestos as a hazardous substance for three successive, successive meetings of the Rotterdam Convention. A meeting, a convention that took some 17 years or so to develop, from 1992, sorry, about 12 years to develop, and uh, now it seems that because the province of you know, Canada also is a federation, the province of Quebec decided to not continue mining asbestos, so the federal government said well, begrudgingly or uh, uh, not really supportive of the fact that asbestos uh, is harmful, but said, oh well, because Quebec uh, decided to close the mine, we'll stop obstructing the passing or the listing of chrysotile as, a, uh, as an asbestos hazard. So who's taken over from Canada now? The Russians, Zimbabwe, and about five other allies. So again, just last month, the Rotterdam Convention failed to include 
Prositol asbestos as a hazardous substance. Now, where do these pressures come from? I said very powerful money interests. But these things lead to pressures for even those of us who work in universities. And if you think that being a tenured full professor really means security, you might think again these days, because these environments can become so toxic against you, from the powers that be to your very peers that you operate with, if you ask questions that are inconvenient questions of the existing paradigms. So we need to work on this and take that back again. We've had it before, but there's no reason not to get it back. We just have to work at it. There are pressures on us to toe the party line, to do what sort of serves the dominant paradigm, the way the business as usual approach to life. Why? Because it supports shareholder interests to shareholder to stockholders at the end of the year. The, the presidents of corporations, in fact, have a legal obligation to maximize opportunities for profits. If they look at long-term futures to protect the environment, these people may indeed be criminally indictable for not protecting the public interest, the, the, the shareholder interest in their uh, corporations. So these same pressures apply throughout the system, from the places that we get our funding from through the peer review of our articles, from questions that we ask. The very, some of us, there's a definition in the Dictionary of Epidemiology called repression bias, or suppression or oppression bias, where you might do a study, you come up with a finding, it doesn't, it's not convenient for the dominant powers that be, so they don't publish it. They give you money and ask you to go away, or they might give you money and say, go and do another study, you must be wrong. So they quiet you down for a few years while you do more research. So I'll come back to that point in just a moment. The way we design our studies and the analysis and interpretation of our studies is very driven by these kinds of frameworks. Remember, public health is an applied science. Applied sciences are much more susceptible to bias and the infiltration of powerful interests than what basic sciences are. Not to say that basic sciences are not, but applied sciences are more sensitive in the sense that when you design a study in epidemiology, if you pick a control group, that looks more like your experimental group, you're going to find no difference. Or you're going to reduce the likelihood of finding a difference. That supports the powerful vested interest, not the public interest that I believe we're in tra training and have been trained to do. So um, also issues of how you disseminate to very job <coughs> security, as I mentioned before. Now, it's not just me that's uh, ranting here about this kind of thing. There are wonderful people out of the United States who've been talking about this for decades. Um, Paul Epstein out of Chicago since 1978 was the one that first introduced me to the idea of powerful money interests in the whole war against cancer, the politics of cancer. Deborah Davis published three books from 2002 through 2010, When Smoke Ran Like Water, Tales of Environmental Deception, The Secret History of the War on Cancer, Disconnect, The Truth About Cell Phone Radiation. David Michaels, just by the way, this is one of Obama's good appointments. He was at George Washington University and published this book called Doubt is Their Product, How Industries Assault on Science Affects Your Health. And um, he's now the head of OSHA and the Occupational Health and Safety Administration in Cincinnati. And then McCulloch and Tweedale, Defending the Intervention is <coughs> Indefensible, the Global Especially. These are just a few books on the topic. There are libraries now exposing what I'm telling you. So if you have an interest in this, write me, email me, as uh, Lovell said, and I'll gladly point you in directions. Why do these industries exist to foment uncertainty? Because the more uncertainty you can foment, the less likely it is that your government is going to be able to make a policy change. Why? Because governments don't like to make decisions in the presence of uncertainty. The more certain they can be, the more sure they can be that what they're doing is the right thing, the, the better it is for them in the future for re-election. So by fomenting uncertainty, the health policy maker's role is undermined, and this is how essentially science is subverted. In the state of New York, in the United States, just a week or two ago, it was just shown how Georgia Pacific and asbestos, among other industries, had infiltrated certain epidemiologic studies and published this work, which now has been discredited by courts of law in New York State. So this is encouraging again that it's now reached the legal realm, but you know we've got a lot more of a challenge to do. I mentioned uh, to, to tackle this uh, effectively. Typically, when one does some work and you find that the work is um, 
contrary to the dominant paradigm. Uh, an industry isn't happy with the finding that you came up with, or a government doesn't, it's not a comfortable truth for them. Um, what you find are these, you, you're usually challenged with what I call the four Ds. If you Google the four Ds, you'll find there are even 13 Ds that people come up with. I like the four Ds, it sums it up nicely based on my own personal experience. First, they'll deny that what you found has any relevance to them. If you persist and you're tenacious enough to say, no, I really did a good piece of work, um, I, I'm, I don't believe that so we can deny this reality, they'll offer you money to go back and do more research, and uh, that's, we want jobs, we have families, we want to you know, buy a house and have a car or whatever it is, so we tend to you know, basically prostitute ourselves to these kinds of interests. And, but what they're doing while, that, while we're going away to do more research, because I'm like, oh, why, what are we scientists? We love to do research. You can't give me anything more exciting to do than to count something, measure it, and do a good analysis and write it up and tie a bow around it and have it published. But we have an obligation in applied sciences to also intervene. There's a time when there's enough knowledge to influence policy, and there's a time to do more research. And that distinction needs to be made. So what they do while I'm busy delaying going to, to do more research, they'll actually find people like me with the qualifications or better qualifications, lesser qualifications, and they'll give them lots of money to do a study that they will tell them, design it in such a way that this that it maybe looks good for you, that tobacco doesn't cause harm. Maybe it's good for you. Um, then when that, they've created those two lines, I go and do my study again and say, no, the result is even more strongly, there is a strong association, it looks causal. They've got other scientists who basically sold their souls to the devil and done the work and <laughs> moved away from the science interest to, to supporting this uh, paid interest. And the industry is then able, or the government or whoever, the NGO, it can happen to anybody. We're all frail in this regard. We're all seducible, trust me. I've been around the block four times in different parts of the world. We're all quite seducible by temptation. What they'll then do is they'll create division among scientists. And science is a very conservative process. So by creating division, it takes years before that positive finding ever sees the real light of day. And then if you still persist that the relationship has to be paid, that we need to give it attention in the public interest, they'll try to discredit you and dig up anything that they can on you. Think of Meryl Streep in... Uh, the movie, uh, I've the time. but there, there are movies on this topic today. <laughs> They'll come and try to kill you. If you I mean, there's billions of dollars at stake. Countries go to war over lesser uh, issues. So, as young people, be aware that there are forces at play that influence both science and policy. Remember the humility component. We need to be hugely vigilant and bear in mind that personal integrity is required to change the course that we're on. To quote from a book, that, uh, a journal called the Journal of Public Health Policy from 1983, Basin and Halpern pointed out that industry's offensive against the regulation of health and safety has its use as academics to downplay or deny the seriousness of the hazards. Here's a cartoon. A cartoon tells a thousand words. So if you look at it, this was in 2004 when DuPont, on the, the fat cat on the right there, uh, was the manufacturer of Teflon, and there was a suspicion that Teflon is linked to birth defects, and he's saying, oh, don't worry, the accusation won't stick. Well, of course, what he's busy doing is going to find money. He'll go and find scientists who'll do science, say, oh, well, Teflon's probably good for you. And this is a joke. Maybe it'll actually create babies that you don't need to bathe because the dirt will just wash right off them. <laughs> But out of Minnesota, this country has had an absolute giant of a, a judge in the name of Miles Lord in 1982. So this goes back a ways, what I'm showing you here. On corporate ethics and environmental pollution, he said at that time, and I submit to you that this 80% number is more like 90, 95% today, but in, in the 1982 period, the corporations create 80% of our gross domestic product or gross national product. They are all entities working have the most potential for good or evil in our society. Now, let's get back to us as individuals. If we're honest with ourselves, many of you are quite a lot younger than what I am, but as you grow through life, you'll recognize that as a kid, you may have <coughs> stolen a candy, you may have done something right, something moral, something not so moral, something ethical, something not so ethical. But because of the way we're socialized, if we're honest with ourselves, we'll recognize that Having peers to keep us on track 
in the public interest is important. Where I'm going with that is this whole notion of institutional review boards, as you call them in the United States. In Canada, they call called human subjects review committees and, and differently in other parts of the world. But why do we need this kind of thing? Because as individuals, our conduct can go from very poor on the left to very good on the right, to dishonest to honesty. The interesting part of this, as pointed out by Lord Acton's premise in the United Kingdom uh, many decades ago, was that power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and that none of us is immune. So this calls on us to think a little bit for being uh, humility, having a bit of humility again. Everyone is frail. Everyone is susceptible to these temptations. It's how we keep ourselves on track and what incentives and disincentives there are in place to keep us on track. So if we come on to the topic of ethics, these are the rules of conduct or behavior that are recognized in respect to a particular class of human actions or a particular group or culture. When it comes to the profession of public health or epidemiology, in particular by statistics, even I believe nursing engineering is a different one, Medicine, I think, is much the same as epidemiology, where governments expect the professions to be self-regulating. They expect us to keep our own house in order, because clearly government really doesn't need to get into the nitty-gritty. They don't really have the expertise to get into the nitty-gritty of whether you designed a study appropriately or inappropriately. They leave it to the profession through peer review to keep that uh, honest. On the other hand, governments do like to get involved when it becomes issues of morality generally relate to principles or habits with respect to right or wrong, and these things are legally enforced. Every profession today, since the American Association for the Advancement of Science started pointing out the collaboration since the late 1940s between corporate money and university support, and I can tell you stories, maybe it'll come up in discussion of recent happenings at Harvard and at, I think, one of the University of California chain of universities of just selling souls to the devil here and protecting corporate interests. It's very sad to see it. But because of all of this, thanks to the American Association for the Advancement of Science being vigilant and pointing to the future that we all need ethics guidelines to help keep ourselves on track, to help socialize our students, and perhaps most importantly for transparency. And in developing these codes of ethics or ethics guidelines, I use the terms synonymously, um, these provide an anchor by developing these guides to ex be explicit about our core values and our mission and our vision as a profession. And if you look at the mission statements of and the core values of many of the public health disciplines, it's to maintain, enhance, and promote health in communities worldwide to work to protect the public health interests above any other interests. This is important stuff for young people to assimilate because maybe, if this is not what your ambition is, maybe you should leave the room now and go and work for some other, you know, sell your soul to somebody else instead of to some good cause, right? There are many opportunities out there to, to do evil in this world. Why ethics in the professions then? To sum up what I said before, to keep ourselves on track or keep our own house in order, to socialize our students, and for professional accountability. Because if these codes or guidelines are posted on websites for the public to see, we promise the public that we're going to keep their data confidential if they participate in research studies, and we suddenly blab about so-and-so having such and such a blood test result, well, we can be held to account. Generally, thank goodness in public health, I'm not aware of any such instance. There are examples, however, where CDC was involved in Tuskegee and Alabama, on syphilis trials, and they passed uh, regulations, but other people can talk to that at another time. The question in public health, whenever we ask a question, from the time that we frame the question in the public interest, we need to ask ourselves, while we're doing this research, and while, because remember, one swallow doesn't make a summer, one research study doesn't prove causation, Who, in whose best interests are we asking the question? Who's taking the risks while we're doing our research? And who's deriving the benefits? It's a good thing to just bear in mind to keep ourselves morally grounded in protecting and serving the public interest. Now, ethics is a discipline that, like public health or nursing, you spend many years training in moral philosophy to become an ethicist, environmental ethicist, clinical ethics, whatever it is. And there are, like in 
many of the other disciplines, there are many approaches or theories. Many of the theories here are the ethical theories in moral philosophy, go from normative ethics, utilitarian, deontological, egalitarian, relational, libertarian, and virtue ethics. So I have a question, and maybe the people in Florida may want, might want to see, if, if they, they may want to ask the question, having been through what they went through with the election of Bush to his second term. Um, what is the ethical framework that the United States as a country subscribes to on that list? Would anyone like to speak up? Not what we subscribe to in science, not what we subscribe to in, um, um, in Canada, but the United States. Which is the ethical framework that the United States most subscribes to on this list? It is there, I promise, not a trick question. No suggestions? Egalitarian? Egalitarian? Utilitarian. Utilitarian? No, I'm sorry, it's, it's neither of those two. It's libertarian. The libertarian ethic is the ethic that is... Uh, you know, some of you may have read books of Ayn Rand. The ultimate in selfishness of the individual right to self-determine what the individual wants to do. Now, it's not to say that any one of these is better than another. It's just to say that we need to recognize which code we are buying into, which, what are our core values, what is hardwired into our brains when we're born in a particular country. Canada happens to be communitarian. France happens to be egalitarian, and I'll come back to that in just a few minutes. Because if we don't understand those issues, then we don't really understand what it takes to become enlightened or to exercise enlightened self-interest, even in the face of these values which were adopted and uh, embraced for very good reasons by the founding, uh, the, the previous generations that founded the United States or Canada or any of these other countries, there is the need to, uh, to recognize this. Now, out of all of these ethical approaches, any one of them derives, out of these derived principles and rules. And we need to make the distinction between prescriptive codes and aspirational codes. Professional guidelines are aspirational, what we ought to do, as opposed to things like the Ten Commandments, which are things that you have to do, right? So thou shalt not do this, that, and the next thing, right? Under the Ten Commandments, or under the Buddhist Code of Moral Conduct, abstaining from taking the lives of living beings, and so on. Oops. Just lost. Should I? Oh, there we go. Ideally, we wouldn't need to even have this afternoon session if we were all capable as human beings of being very honorable, not being able to be tempted by money, not being greedy people, and so on, if we could abide by the so-called golden rule. Now think about this. All of us have had some level of biblical training at some point, I presume. Even if we're atheists, I think we have some sense of the golden rule from uh, rubbing off on us at school from our friends. The first three bullets there are the golden rule as embedded in religious teachings, whichever, whether it's the Old Testament, the New Testament, or even from uh, the Prophet Muhammad's last sermon, it all says the same thing, what is hateful unto you, do not do unto your neighbor. Treat others as we want them to treat us, or our loved ones, treat others justly. So you wouldn't want to sell your soul to the devil, because if you sell your soul to the devil and somebody else sells, sells, sells their soul to the devil, well, you're not going to necessarily look so good at the end of the day for what they might do unto you instead of what you're doing unto them. So move away from the religious aspect of this. I've tried to adapt the golden rule with the two bottom uh, points that as professionals we have the obligation to do our level best, and if we find that someone else has not exercise the principles of our discipline appropriately, we should call them on it and try to correct whatever it is that they have done that is not consistent with science in the public interest. Most people don't deal with confrontation very well, and that last point does call for us to be a little bit confrontational, but our professional societies can help us in that regard, as can peer review. Now, the scientific ethic is the ethic that falls under this uh, domain called deontology. It's a duty-based ethic, and that's where the scientific ethic falls. And the scientific ethic says to us uh, that we have a set of norms, 
These norms uh, define the scientific endeavor. It's an ethos that evolved gradually and organically from within the profession over the years. Think about science 50 to 60 years ago, at the time of the Second World War. A handful of scientists probably existed permanently over the globe. They rubbed shoulders. They tended to keep themselves on track. Today, for most of you that know a bit of statistics, when you've got a normal distribution, the more people you look at, the more you're going to find people in the tails, extremely good, extremely bad behaviors. The professional ethics embody some of these norms, but the ethics of science is more like a charter that makes science possible than like a law book that spells out specific rules. It defines the boundaries that must be respected by those of us that wish to remain part of the scientific community. So if we look at duty-based ethics, this will resonate with many of you, I'm sure. The science uh, the scientific ethics expects of us as scientists to use appropriate methods, to not design studies with a preordained outcome that you're trying to prove. Okay? Science requires objectivity and impartiality. And the second point, we need to be honest in how we report our science. We must publish results, whether they're positive and negative or neutral results. We must prohibit distortion in our science. We see examples in this case in New York City. They've shown the fabrication of data. It's unbelievable what these people will do to, uh, to earn the two or three or four or twenty million dollars a year that you can earn. So I make it sound very attractive to you. If you really want to get out there and work for these devils, you can do it. Um, so the falsification bias in the way we design our studies, we need to use proper analytical procedures, we need to be objective, we should do our own work. Don't plagiarize. I'll give you an example. The professor, the, the dean of the faculty of medicine at my university was recently severed because he gave a speech, a commencement speech, at which he quoted from, I think, somebody from California, and he just, all he needed to say was, I'm giving these extensive quotes from the speech from California, and he would have been off the hook, but I'm pleased to say that my university had the good sense to have him leave the office, because this does not set a good example for young people. Rot at the top, rot permeates the whole system. So we should acknowledge our sources, and we should not exploit graduate students. You know, there was a time up until about 20 years ago where if you were my grad student, your name wouldn't even appear on, your, on, your, on a published paper out of your work. It would be on your thesis, but the paper would be under my name, and you might be or it might not be acknowledged in it. Today, our job is to push the students forward to be the first authors on these things. Essentially, good science and good ethics go hand in hand. Now, for many of us who've studied um, bioethics, we'll be aware that there are four foundational principles, and this also comes from Beecham and Childress at, the, uh, at George Washington University, I believe. Um, uh, through the, their, their book is in the fifth or sixth edition. It's the basic uh, classic now in bioethics. And what they point out is um, four principles, and it's what we call the Georgetown mantra. Whenever you think of being ethical, you think of respecting autonomy, beneficence, non maleficence, <coughs> and justice. Now, what is respect for autonomy? It requires respect for individual rights and freedoms. Need to make the distinction here between voluntary and involuntary exposures if we're talking about what people might be exposed to in terms of environmental epidemiology studies or occupational epidemiology studies. Beneficence requires that we do good through the questions that we're asking in our research proposals that go before institutional review boards for review. We need to consider the consequences of interventions in people's lives and of the findings on those people's lives. Oftentimes, Particularly at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, um, American investigators, NIH, came out with a new set of guidelines to control this, but they would just, because you need to study diseases where they occur, they would take their money and their um, test tubes and so on and go into Africa, parachute in, do a study, take the bloods, return to the States, do the analysis, and the local community that took the risks, who gave the blood, used to see nothing of the output of that research. Certainly, no infrastructure was left to support the local community. Those times hopefully have changed. We should do no harm is non-maleficence. And justice or social justice or distributive justice requires fair and equitable allocation of risks and benefits to all without discrimination. 
So these are the four basic principles of bioethics. But now, as soon as we move into the field of public health ethics, these get expanded a bit. But before we go to that, I just need to make the point that it is not humanly possible for any one of us in any study to score, say, 10 out of 10 on autonomy, beneficence, non-beneficence, and justice. There are going to be trade-offs on some of these. The point of the guidelines is to force us to think carefully about uh, and, and transparently about how we came to that rational judgment to give more weight to autonomy and to non-maleficence, for example, as an example. So there's a constant tension among those four principles, and our aim in being ethical researchers is to maximize each of the, the four of those principles. But as soon as we move into other public health ethical principles, public health is much broader than bioethics or medical ethics, our job is to protect the most vulnerable in society. It really could be seen as falling under that broad heading of beneficence. We need to involve communities in our research. If you look at the ethics guidelines for the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology, the American College of Epidemiology, you'll find that communities need to be involved is the question we're asking, even relevant and important, deemed important to the community. We don't just parachute in and ask questions because we're going to get a thesis out of it. It needs to be something useful to, to the community. We need to serve the public health interest above any other interest, and we should always act with integrity. And these are the main headings that I, I believe these fall under. In addition, the fundamental principles of bioethics include the <laughs> justice principle, environmental justice, as I alluded to earlier, we have to ask who's taking the risks, who's deriving the benefits. And there's another principle called the polluter pays principle. This is a wonderful principle in terms of creating disincentives for people polluting environments contrary to the law, going and dumping uh, barrels of uh, toxic uh, effluent from their plants into ri upstream rivers from water treatment plants, for example. We had that situation in Edmonton, where I live. The proportionary principle is another one. This principle, certainly under the Bush administration, I think you could have really severely lost your job if you had spoken about the precautionary principle. This is the principle of prevention. It is everything that we stand for in epidemiology. This was not liked by the United States. Canada, interestingly enough, is in a sort of schizophrenic position. I don't know if you know, but Canada is not just upstate New York, but it's a big country north of the United States, right? A basic parallel or something. And, um, and where I come from is upstate, if you like, Montana, right? North of Montana is the province of Alberta. And um, Canada really derives its principles and its founding um, values from Europe. And Europe, in entrenched legislation called the REACH uh, laws and, and uh, governance, to ensure that everything, that if we don't take new products and test them on the community and wait for people to die, we wait for the companies that want to develop the products to first prove that it's not harmful before they can commercialize it. The proportionary principle as a result was absolutely poo-pooed in a neoliberal economic basis like we have in North America, both in the United States and Canada. It's business and jobs. It doesn't matter what the health consequences are, as long as it's creating jobs and creating business, that's all they care about. You heard about that from uh, Michael Marmot, you heard about it from the other speakers. But in fact, where there is a risk from a certain agent, the presence of uncertainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent such exposures. And this is what really underlies the point I was making earlier. There's a time as a scientist to do more research, by all means, you love to count, you love to do, you like to publish, you need to for your job security and so on. And it's important to narrow uncertainties and do science. But there is a time when there is enough science to effect policy change. You don't let the policymaker say, we need more science, it's just a delay tactic in many instances. So the distinction then between guidelines and codes that I need to make, I said I use guidelines and codes synonymously, that's not... Uh, entirely appropriate given the slide, but I do, it just comes out that way. Uh, guidelines are things that are aspirational, they normative statements that are uh, not prescriptive. It's not to be seen as a list or a checklist. So this is the worst thing that folks, especially in the modern generation, would see as ethics being. 
It is not something that you sit behind a computer screen quietly in the darkness of night in your study or at home doing your work where you go through the list and say, oh yeah, I'm proposing this study and it's got, I'm meeting the requirements for autonomy and non maleficence beneficence, precautionary principle, and check it, check it off. It's meant to set the basis for a discussion with your peers, with the communities that you want to do research on. So it's good to, to use this as trigger points for conversation, not to quietly sit in your uh, passion and your zealousness to do science, to just rush ahead. But there is this important step to go through to cause you to be mindful, to be thoughtful about the questions you're asking. Recognize the context. You heard that a lot this morning. Recognize the tensions among the different principles. And please don't treat ethics guidelines as a checklist. I mentioned the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology. We just updated those guidelines and they're fully accessible at that link. Uh, so as I said, it's a hot link. So these principles and have certain utility. They provide a normative basis among thoughtful people to do work in the public interest. They provide transparency for our collective values in protecting the public interest. And they provide accountability for the actions that we do ultimately take. Now it's important to make a distinction that it's not just all checklists or guidelines or codes or whatever it is. There's a thing called virtuous behavior Virtues do not replace ethical rules. Rather, they provide an account of professional ethics as a more complete if virtuous traits of character are identified. And these virtues, for example, I mentioned humility as being one. You see it at the top. Respect the input and opinions of others. It requires self-effacement. Fidelity, honor your commitments and promote trust. Demonstrate justice, that is act fairly. We heard a lot about fairness this morning. Be patient, take the time to gather viewpoints of others, be industrious, do your level best. Veracity is to tell the truth and be honest. Have compassion, be empathetic. Have integrity, demonstrate good moral character. Serve, protect the most vulnerable, serve the public interest. And be prudent, err on the side of caution, demonstrate good judgment. So these are virtues of professionals. Now, in the field of classical risk assessment, how does this all come to bear on how our work actually gets done and how does it actually impact policy? Classical risk assessment, it's been changing for the past few years, but it's typically done this way. It's a reductionist, linear approach to dealing with the issue of does a certain contaminant have an ill effect on a community? You're first expected to do what's called a hazard assessment. So does this hazard or this toxin really exist out there? And then number two, if it exists out there, are people vulnerable to it? Or if you're a veterinary epidemiologist, are animals vulnerable? Are they potentially exposed to it? If they are, then you might want to go to step three and do a risk evaluation. A risk evaluation would be a typical epidemiologic study. You would do a case series or a, a case control study or something like that to see if the people exposed really are at increased risk from the nature of that particular chemical. And please let me assure you, that's what industry loves us to do. Even though there might be a ton of good research out of the United States, talk about Australia, talk about Africa, talk about Europe, the scientists there, A, have a vested interest in doing the same research, replicating it locally, so they want to do more research, and of course that serves the interest of delaying decisions because we're waiting on more research to come in. When you agree to do these three things, then you've got to figure out how you're going to communicate any risk you come up with and then how you're going to manage it. So this is a classic risk management Sorry, situation. Now we heard about everything being context related, and I repeat that here, how important context is in what we're doing. Um, context is everything in applied ethics. It relates to the very nature of the culture that you're wanting to study, to the nature of the legislative frameworks within which you're operating, and so on. Now I said something about libertarian values in the United States. Look at this slide carefully and see how it resonates with you. All of you who were born in the United States, I believe, have hardwired in your brains this notion of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You have absolutely no responsibilities whatsoever. You have every entitlement to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness under this framework. Anyone want to disagree with that? That's how it reads to most people who study this. Let's compare it, and this was the founding 
generations of this country in 1776 who came up with this great idea, and it is a great idea for sure. Compare it to France, which has egalitarian values, as I mentioned earlier, liberty, equality, and fraternity. So that brotherhood notion, I guess they could have called it Philadelphia or something if they had wanted to, but life, liberty, life, liberty, equality, and fraternity really came about in about 10 years after the founding of the United States when there was the French Revolution. And what gave rise to the French Revolution, this is actually not a fair translation of the French, but the wife of of the king at the time, Louis XVI, his wife Marie Antoinette, is attributed with having insensitively come onto the palace balcony and said to the farmers and the, the, the people who um, farmed the fields for the king that uh, they were starving. Probably there was some drought or something had happened. Um, if they cannot afford to eat bread, let them eat cake. Well, that's a pretty insensitive thing for the wife of a of a king to say, and um, it led to the French Revolution, which re led to the life, liberty, equality, and fraternity idea. Now, Canada, your neighbor to the north, which is your single largest trading partner, for those of you that don't know it, and the country that you're leaning on very heavily to keep you in supply of fresh water when the need comes, um, has, was founded on communitarian values. But this might sound very sort of boring to most Americans and, and French people. I mean, look at what Canada was founded on. Peace, order, and good government. Uh, well, this means obligations, no entitlements, like they seem to have in other parts of the world. But there's a certain nice thing that comes with this. We have had access to universal health care for a long time. It's easy. It's good government when you have that kind of framework. But as I said before, it's not to say that one is better or worse. It's a question of understanding this history. Somebody alluded to the need to understand history this morning. And um, indeed, by understanding that history, we can understand what it takes for enlightened self-interest and for people even in Texas to understand that by voting against their best interests is really a silly thing to do. That there is another way, as I think Obama said when he was standing for election. So, distinguish then from all of these things between <laughs> rights and duties. Here's a wonderful example of an application, but it needs to be prefaced with a question to all of you. Is science, the, the whole endeavor of science, is it value-free, or put another way, is science value-neutral? Is science value-free? Anyone thinking that science is value-free? Please put up your hands. Great. Now, science is absolutely not value-free, from the very nature of how we frame our questions to the way we conduct our research, to where we decide to archive our data and publish our data, it's all values-driven. That's why it's so important to understand that our values are there to protect the public interest, among others. Let me show you two examples coming out of the United States. A very uh, former colleague of mine, Douglas Weed, from the National Cancer Institute in Washington, or Bethesda, published a work of relevance in 1997. And this is just a classic in, in my book in terms of making the point about professional ethics and understanding our core values. The title of the paper is rather complicated and convoluted. It's called Underdetermination and Incommensurability in Contemporary Epidemiology. Let's not worry too much about the title, but let's look at what he actually showed. He used two examples in his study in a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is where you take already published data, and if you have access to the actual raw data, you try to combine it, or you look at how the different studies uh, assessed risk and what those risk estimates were. So if you found that most of the studies, say 25 studies or 50 <coughs> studies, have been done to look at alcohol and breast cancer, the connection between alcohol and breast cancer, or 50 studies have been done looking at induced abortion and breast cancer, me for using these terms. I, I don't know in the deep south how people relate to this, but you'll see the point that I'm making in just a moment. What Doug we did was we got a whole series of absolute renowned epidemiologists in the northern part of this country and a group of epidemiologists in the southern part of this country to evaluate more or less the same sets of studies. And guess what they came up with? The group from the northern part of the USA found that indeed there's no relationship 
that alcohol consumption does not induce breast cancer, that induced abortion does not result in breast cancer. But the group of epidemiologists in the southern part of this country, in fact, found, felt very compellingly that the data showed that indeed there was a connection between the two. So, you know, you see this kind of stuff in the literature, what's the public to think? You know, they say, eat margarine, eat butter. Now, margarine's no good, butter's good, you know. This is very confusing for the public. So you have a situation of Main Street news on the left, Wall Street news, the, the, the stock market on the right. You see the same headline, 705,000 new jobs create hope for Main Street, and 705,000 jobs create panic for Wall Street. Same planet, different worlds just to be aware of these issues. Now, what were these panels of scientists, of epidemiologists, doing in that weed study from the National Cancer Institute? They were applying what are called the Hill criteria. And I put that in quotation marks because if Hill was still alive, he'd be spinning, well, he, I'm sure he's spinning in his grave every time people hear the word criteria because like the guidelines, it's a checklist. It's not, I'm sorry, it's not a checklist. It's meant to be a thoughtful, a thought-provoking basis for thinking more deeply about the nature of what it is you're trying to assess. He actually called them aspects or perspectives. So the Hill's perspectives, but these are the points. Look at the strength of the evidence, consistency across all of the studies, the specificity of the effects. Obviously, I don't have time to go. This is Epidemiology 101 and takes a few lectures to go through this. But these two teams of epidemiologists applied the same aspects or perspectives and came up with diametrically opposed answers to this question. Hill cautions us, broad interpretation of the evidence with respect to his aspects. This was from 1965 when he published this work. He says, use these aspects as a guide to help answer if there is any other way to explain the set of facts before us. Do not discount <coughs> associations because there is insufficient evidence or understanding at one point in time. Causal judgments do not require perfect information and must be considered in the context of available knowledge and a responsibility to protect health. And this is the rub here that he concludes, all scientific work is incomplete, however good your study is, you may have done the best study ever, but trust me, there's always an opportunity for more, better measuring techniques and different ways of uh, framing issues and collecting data and analyzing data. Science is always something that can be done. You know, you've always seen in scientific papers when you read them, more research is needed. Right? So, and I say that somewhat sarcastically, but you know, oftentimes that is true, certainly. It's not to say nothing is like George Bush would like us to believe. You're not on an axis and it's all red and white or black and white, or you know, you're either on the axis or off the axis. Life really is all shades of grey, so bear that in mind in science too. All scientific work is liable to be upset or modified by advancing knowledge, and this is where the public health uh, importance is in this last sentence. All of this, these two sentences that preceded, do not confer upon us a freedom to ignore the knowledge we already have or to postpone the action that it appears to demand at a given time. Could I get the next slide? Go ahead, click. Thank you. Okay, so to make this point, this next slide is a bit crude, but if you'll bear with me, I think it makes the point beautifully in showing cultural differences, and I'll be explicit in the use of reading it. So this is on risk perception, and it's called My Karma Ran Over Your Dogma. And Taoists say that shit happens. Confucianists say shit happens. Islamists say, if shit happens, it is the will of Allah. Protestants, let shit happen to somebody else. Catholics, if shit happens, you deserve it. If you're Zen, what is the sound of shit happening? <laughs> Could I have the next slide? Thank you. If you're an agnostic, what is the shit? If you're an atheist, I don't believe the shit. If you're a Jew, why does the shit always happen to us? If you're a Hindu, the shit has happened before. If you're a Buddhist, if shit happens, it really isn't shit. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness, ask me into your house and I will tell you why shit happens. So the challenge, the challenge before all of us, the challenge before, so it's how you see it. 
It's how you see it, where you sit, and in a pluralistic, multicultural society like we have in North America. We have to bear this and be sensitive to this. Take it seriously. Involve these communities in raising the question. I go back to the point, who takes, who takes risks while, well, who derives benefits, whose interests are being served in this or that question that you're asking or in formulating a policy. Does the burden of proof, this relates to the proportionary principle, does the burden of proof of safety lie on the, or lay on the proponent or on Joe and Jane public? The take home message from my talk as I wrap up, Uncertainty is inherent to science. It will always be there. Our job in science is to reduce these uncertainties as best we can, but there is a time when there's enough of the science and action for policy can take place. Remember, if we even make a wrong policy today and science eventually comes through and says, we could actually go back and keep drilling for oil and fracking and it's all good for the environment and it's going to save the world and save us and we're going to live for eternity, um, then we can go back and change the policy and start fracking again. It's not going anywhere. The asbestos is still underground. The oil is still there. The gas is still there. Science strives to be value neutral. Bear this in mind. That's what science strives to be, but the human instrument is <coughs> incapable of being value neutral. So look first to ourselves, because causal inference is a function of who it is that is making the inference, which in turn is a function of how we apply our scientific methods. So we'll defer discussion to the end, unless there is a very pressing question of something you didn't understand because of my funny accent. And I'm just wondering why I will put the session, put me here today with Michael Marmot. I think he's trying to get the English accents out the way today, so then you can confine yourself to other accents for the rest of the week. But I hope you've been able to follow me, and thanks for your attention.